So there's a huge difference between different companies on how much they embrace technology and how you can make working on board a ship better and more efficient. That being said, going digital in the shipping industry today is difficult. There are a lot of great solutions out there, but they're not connected. Welcome to the Shipping Podcast, where I meet interesting maritime professionals sharing their passion for the shipping industry and their everyday job. I am your host. My name is Lena Gothberg. Hello, Shipping Podcast listeners, and welcome to the episode 127, where you will be listening to Michael Laurin, CEO of Lean Marine. This is the last episode of this decade, and it's the 26th episode during 2019. I think it's a very good timing to listen to Michael Laurin former ship owner, and now technical supplier to the maritime industry. Now, when it's late in December, with only a few days until January the 1st, 2020, when the IMO 2020 regulations come into force. If you haven't heard about the IMO 2020, you can sum it up by saying that only fuels with the sulfur content below 0.5%, down from the standard 3.5%, can be used from January the 1st, 2020. This interview, however, was done last summer, on July the 11th, to be more exact. I know Mikael since his time with the family-owned company Laurin Maritime, and it's with great pleasure that I introduce him to you. Please enjoy our conversation. Welcome to the Shipping Podcast. Could you please introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Michael Laurin. I am the CEO of a company called Lean Marine that works with fuel efficiency and measuring and analysis. And what is your background? My background is, if we go all the way back, I'm an engineer, industrial engineering and management from educated in Gothenburg from the outset. After that, I actually did 18 months in the Swedish Navy. So that was not the start of my shipping interest, but a continuation of it. Following that, I was recruited by what is now Accenture, a big consultancy firm, which was a great way to start your career because you went into a huge corporation, you got educated, you got to sort of get a lot of the work process sorted out. On the other hand, after a little while, I was mistakenly headhunted by a smaller consultancy firm. And by mistakenly headhunted, I was headhunted by a friend who was working with headhunting. But the company wasn't looking for my profile at all, but a much more senior person. Anyhow, they employed me nonetheless, which was great for me because that put me into a very different context. This was a small 16-person venture capital-owned consultancy firm in 1999, so was full blast on the whole IT carousel. And then we saw the complete IT crash as well. So it was a, you learned a lot from that, seeing both the ups and downs of an industry. I stayed there for a couple of years and did a lot of very interesting and very varied projects for big companies and small, a little bit in Saudi Arabia and Czech Republic, in Sweden. And then a couple of us realized that we wanted to do something else. So we quit and started our own consultancy firm, which was also a great experience because then you needed to build everything from scratch. Everything from time reporting to how you bill your customers to your brand profile. We actually built between the seven of us. And it was a very fun journey to basically start sitting in one of the guy's living room with his very mean cat and then moving from that into getting the company set up, getting the customers in and starting to build our specialities. And what was that, your speciality? What did you do then? Strategy consulting in marketing mainly and more focused on the telecoms industry. Mm. So we did a lot for the telecom industry, a lot for uh, digital media in general. 
we try to work a lot with the outset of internet TV, what is now YouTube and all of that, mm-hmm. uh, which was a fun job as well, because it was all in its infancy and nothing was really developed. So a lot of the projects went nowhere, but it was a fun learning curve on it. After being there for a couple of years, with the ups and downs again, uh, the company went amazing for a year or two, and then we had a very dull summer where we uh, more or less closed shop and then managed to start up again. I realized that my heritage was calling. And to get back to that, my career in shipping really started when I was extremely young because my parents have always worked in shipping, especially my father. And when I was eight years old, my father and my mother started a ship owning company, Lauren Maritime. And that was in 1980. That was in 1980. And ever since then, that's always ships and shipping has always been part of the Sunday dinner conversation. And for me, it even started when I was eight and my parents, my mother gave me a blank piece of paper gave me some instructions and told me, okay, this is going to be the brand, the flag for the company. Can you please help me color it? Wow. She told me what to do, so I didn't do much, but it was still fond memory of the startup of the company. So after the consultancy firms, I realized I had now done something different because for me, it was very important not to start immediately in the family company because then you might lose perspective. Now I've been working with other things for like seven years. And the shipping company was doing well and needed, maybe not my experience, but I wanted to get, be more part of it and saw that the timing was right. So I started working in Lauren Maritime in the Houston office, where I stayed for five years, uh, which was a great journey as well. That was a different job from the jobs I've had before, because then I came in with people who'd been there more or less from the start, who knew every nut and bolt on the ships, and everything about the business, while I was a fairly much a novice. But it was great to work with these people. They were extremely knowledgeable, extremely team-oriented. So it was a fairly quick process to get to learn a lot about the shipping industry. There's still so much to learn. But anyhow, you got I got off to a flying start with that. So that was a lot of fun as well. How old were you then when you started, when you came back? I started in when I was 32. Mm-hmm. And you also have sisters working? I also had sisters, exactly. In the family, it's my mother and my father who started the company. And then I have three sisters. So in the company, when I started, two of my sisters were already working there. One as an environmental manager, Marissa, and Ulrika, my other sister, as a commercial director. So I came in as the third one. And a few years after that, The last sister actually came in, Anneli, working with marketing and things like that. But you are the baby brother. I'm number two in order. But we're fairly close together. So even though age makes a big difference in a family constellation, age-wise, we're very similar in age. Mm -hmm. But that was fun as well, working with a family. Working in a family company is always challenging because you don't only have the hierarchical structure, you also have a lot of luggage or old stories from when you were young. So it's a little bit more difficult, I would say, but there's also a lot of benefits because you do know each other extremely well on a very different level. And all the way through working with Lauren Maritime, we've had an extremely good cooperation, both with my father and mother, mother, but also with my sisters. So you didn't feel it like a pressure to come back or to be in that? Of course it was a pressure. There was always, but it was very well managed. My parents always told us, you can do whatever you want, no pressure. But there's always some sort of pressure in there. There's always expectations. But then again, they managed it very well, I must say, for all of us. Mm. Uh, And we also, very early on, when we started working together, all of the siblings sat down and talked about it. How do we want to manage this? What are our roles going to be? And what's important? So we could set the ground rules for working together and where we want to go. And I know Ulrika was very clear, always stating, 
our relationship is more important than the company. I.e., whatever we do, let's make sure we keep the family together and don't start fighting. That said, the company is extremely important. But even so, I think that was a good mindset to have. That when you start, we didn't always agree, that's for sure. But when we started disagreeing, we could always sort of reset and say, okay, what's more important here? Which order do we want to do things? Do we need outside help to get a third opinion? How do we solve the problem? So may- maybe we should talk about the Lauren Maritime. What was the company? What was the ship owning? Lauren Maritime uh, was a tanker owner. We had the last 10 or so years full focus on MR th- tankers, i.e. 45 to 50,000 ton tankers in the clean petroleum product and chemicals segment. So what we did, we'd had mainly large contracts going from uh, USA to Mexico, USA to South America, over to Asia and back to Europe. So we did worldwide trade with a mix of clean petroleum products, i.e. gasoline and diesel, a lot of vegetable oils, soybean oils and uh, other oils, and a lot of caustic soda. We were fairly early on to ship caustic soda to the alumina industry in South America. So we had a lot of, for us, very large contracts did about a million tons of caustic soda down to South America every year for many years. So that's what we did. The company was over time about 15 to 20 ships in that size. So we were roughly about 450 to 500 people working in the company. The way we worked with the company as well, as I said, we had a very large group of people who had been with the company more or less from the beginning. Some of them had been sailing on the first couple of ships and then gone ashore to have shore-based uh, professions. And that gave us a very good connection with the ships because they knew the ships and the people on board. And one very important aspect on how we ran the vessels is how it started out. Because when my father and mother started the company, my father called a few good officers that he knew and said, do you want to come work with my company? And one of them, that became a few of them, said, okay, we'll come. But we don't want anybody short telling us what to do because we know how to run a ship. My father said, fair, that's okay. Let's do it that way. So when the company was started, we had an extremely small organization, two ships, And my father, my mother, and a technical guy on the shore side, that was it. Everything else was taken care of by the crew on board. This proved to be a very successful way of doing it. Because if you have the right people on board, they know the ship. They know the crew on board, the team on board. And they can actually make the best decisions. So that was a concept that we held on to all the way through. And it worked really well. Over time, with more and more regulation, more and more being a bigger company, needing more standardization, the system changed a bit. So now people on board are not as empowered as they were initially, but we've kept the vital parts of the system, made sure that the people we have on board, they can make a lot of decisions and they can influence a lot of decisions where it might be taken ashore or elsewhere. And what that gives you is people on board who want to be involved, who want to take charge, who feel that this is my crew. It's not a crew of people sent from from some office somewhere. And that gave us people in the company that really felt ownership for their vessel, for their crew, and for their cargo, which worked out really well. Every once in a while, you got a person who didn't fit, then you had to do something about it. But most people worked out really, really well. I remember you were famous for that. I wouldn't say famous. Yes, but you I've... were. You did probably not know, but but people were talking about your brand in a fond way. And, and that was part of it, I think. Maybe. I know a lot of other companies try to emulate parts of it, but I think very few companies, with the exception of small owner-led companies where the owners are sailing have gone that far, actually, Mm. keeping the size. But it was always a bit of a struggle, especially with regulation, because there's so much regulation in the tanker industry 
that basically counteracts what we tried to do. Some other regulation, when it came into force, we had to go to the regulating authority and tell them, this is how we do things. So we do not have a superintendent that will tell the captain what to do. The captain is the superintendent and he will tell himself what to do. So sometimes we had to uh, do a bit of explaining. We had to fill in forms on whatever it was, surveys or surveyors. I, was, I think I was more referring to people who were working on ships and sailing. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. No, I think a lot of, again, the people we had that enjoyed the system, they stayed on mm. because they thought this, most of them, was the best way to run a ship. Mm. And they felt that this is the way I want to work. So I think that from that perspective, it worked out really, really well. But now there is no more Laurin Maritime. No, a little bit more than a year ago, we sold the company to Team Tankers. So now it's part of Team Tankers. We were very happy with that solution because Team Tankers also took over the whole team and the whole company. And we felt that we needed to become part of a bigger entity. Looking at how shipping has evolved over time, we see that being a medium-sized company that we were with sort of 15 to, to 18 ships, that was difficult. If you're small, you can be nimble. You usually have your financing sorted out and so on. At the medium size, financing is difficult because financing, especially bank financing and other sort of arranged financing is usually in the millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. And we were not big enough for that type of financing. Also, regulation and management has scale, ben benefits of scale. So being in the medium size, we had 11 ships on management. That wasn't very efficient. So we were very happy to become part of a bigger entity with Team Tankers and I uh, think that has worked out really well. And they've kept a lot of the culture, the heritage from Lauren Maritime as well. So you are not the CEO of Lauren Maritime anymore, but you are still a CEO again. I'm still a CEO. I'm still part of the board of Team Tankers, so I'm a little bit involved there. But now I'm the CEO of a company called Lean Marine. This is a company that I've known for a while because Lowry Maritime was actually one of Lean Marine's first customers. And I've been had the benefit of working on both sides of the table when it comes to Lean Marine. Initially, I was a skeptical boss who had my technical people and the salespeople from Lean Marine coming and telling me this is a fantastic product. It really works and it will help save you fuel. And me being skeptical, saying, oh, hi, how, why? Why didn't anybody else do this? Why isn't this done already? And then actually, eventually, we installed it on all of the ships and have been very, very happy with the result. We've seen huge fuel savings from it uh, and also operational benefits in how to run the ships. So what, it, what is it? What it is, we have two main products. One is FuelOpt, which is a control system you install on the vessel. And what it does is basically work as a cruise control for the vessel. Most vessels today, they have an engine and a propeller. And you run the engine and the propeller with one uh, le lever. That lever controls the RPM of the engine, i.e. how fast the engine rotates, and thus how fast the propeller rotates. Some ships have a propeller where you can turn the blades, controlled by pitch propeller. If you have that, you can control speed by engine speed and how much you pitch the propeller to give propulsive power into the water. And that's it. If you want to go faster, you run the engine at faster RPM or higher RPM. If you want to go slower, you put it down. Or if you have a control of pitch propeller, you can control it that way as well. That gives you some way of controlling how much power you put in the water. But it's usually controlled with a lot of safety margin according to a preset curve and you don't have any other option. What our system does is that it controls this dynamically. So it checks all the temperature of the engine, the speed you're going, how hard the engine is working, and then sets the optimal value for the propeller and the engine. And that way you can always have the optimal running parameters. Also, it gives the captain on board or the company new ways of controlling the engine. If you want to run the engine on power instead of 
how much it rotates, how many times per minute it rotates. That's a more efficient way to run it. You can also run the engine on consumption. If you know you want to consume 40 metric tons of fuel per day, you can set that. And then you know you'll never go above that. If you're running an RPM, you come into hard weather, the engine will work harder, but not give you more speed. So you're actually losing fuel just on banging against the waves. This you can solve. You can get rid of this problem. You can look at it as a cruise control for the vessel, where it's running smarter and more efficiently. So we're getting a lot of benefits. Again, with the controller pitch propeller, you can run it more efficiently. We see customers that get fleet-wide 10% savings. We've seen customers with bigger savings than that. We've seen ships without controller pitch propellers that run between uh, 4 to 7% savings, just on how you run the ships. And then you have additional benefits. One is the discussion between shore and the vessel becomes much easier because the shore can tell, organization can tell the vessel, run it on this effect. Then we know what the consumption is. And they can get more exact way of running the ship. A lot of ship owners you talk to, they are a little bit frustrated because they have two ships with different captains or chief engineers, and they have very different consumption. This way you can get it controlled all the way. You know what, how the ship is being run. You know it's being run evenly, which is always better than running it unevenly. Uh, one example we usually do is if you're, if you're biking on a bicycle and you're going up and down a hill, you will not be doing the same speed uphill as you will be doing downhill or on flat ground. Same thing here. If you save your energy a bit and take it easy uphill and then go full speed downhill to use the momentum there, you're going to save fuel or in the bicycle case, your own power. Hmm. And then you have a second product. The second product is something that I think is very important. I'll go back a little bit to Lauren Maritime. Something we realized early on was that sustainability is really important and fuel is a huge cost. The good thing with being a family company is that you have different, also in our family anyhow, you have different views, you have different uh, mindsets. And Marissa, uh, one of my sisters, she was very environmentally focused. It was extremely important for her. So she became very early on for the shipping industry, our bad conscience, to put it that way. So she pushed for everything and did an amazing job getting us conscious. So we started with everything, looking at how many paper we printed, turning off the lights, to, of course, the big items. How do we run the ships? How can we save fuel on board? How can we make things more efficient and more sustainable? So from that perspective, we started doing a lot of things. We started working with uh, variable frequency on the pumps and on fans. And then when we measured it, we realized we couldn't see the effect. We knew we had saved fuel, but we couldn't measure how much. So we realized if you can measure it, you can manage it. But if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. You don't know if you're doing the right things. So we fairly early on, uh, installed um, data log systems to get high frequency measuring of speed, distance were gone, fuel consumption, and a lot of other parameters. And that helped us actually realize what we were doing and what we were doing right and what we were we could be doing better. So that's something that was very important for us to get into that point. You have to have the data to have inf make informed decisions. Going back to Lean Marine, our second product is an afterthought in a way, because when the company started installing the fuel saving equipment, they said, okay, we need to prove to the customer that this really works. And since the system needs a lot of input to be able to dynamically find the right working conditions or the optimal working conditions, all the data was in the system. And then they basically built an interface to the data. And that is now a reporting and analysis tool, cloud-based, where you can see for your vessels exactly uh, how fast they've been going, how much fuel they've been consuming, where they've been. You can have weather factors in there. You can get all your turbo charger temperatures and all sort of fun stuff in there. And that gives the technical department a fantastic tool for actually 
measuring afterwards. What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? Is there something we need to change? And is there something we can do better? On top of that, we've also added a reporting tool. So the captain or the ship can report a few manual parameters. When does the sea voyage start? When does it end? Is it ballast laden? Any corrections to the measured values on board? And that gives you all the data you need to get ready-made voyage reports. The MRV reporting, which is an EU requirement now for emissions, can be made automated by the system. You press a button and then you get the whole report done, which is a lot of work saving for a lot of companies because that can be a, quite a tedious work to get all the fuel consumption from all the ships on all the voyages and accumulate that together with the amount of cargo being carried. So there are a lot of benefits with the system. And for me, it fits in very well with what we started in Lord Maritime, working hard with measuring, making improvements to make the operations more efficient, and then seeing how that works, tweaking it further and keep going. The good thing with Lauren Maritime when it comes to sustainability as well is that we had this amazing people in the company. So they understood the benefits of doing this, that this actually affects the bottom line. This affects what the company makes. This affects how the engine is run. This simplifies things for us. And that is something that I think is extremely important in the shipping industry that we need to m work more on. Not having fantastic people, everybody wants to have fantastic people, but educating them and setting the right culture. Because even on the Lauren Maritime ships, we realized that putting measuring equipment on board didn't make a difference. We actually did that on one vessel. Put the equipment on board, sent them the manuals and did nothing for not by default, but it just happened to be that way. Three months later, we measured and nothing much had happened. And then our environmental manager, Per Brandholm, went on board for a week, did a full ship education. This is how you use the system. This is what you can learn. This is how you can improve. And we saw 9.4% fuel savings from education alone. That is a very, very cheap way to save fuel. Just by educate people getting the culture of working in sustainable ways. And I think that's something that sometimes is missed by a lot of companies. Uh, the international shipping industry today can be very fragmented with a technical manager, an owner, and a commercial manager running the ship. And they don't always have the same agenda, basically. Mm. It's interesting. Because I think uh, working culture is everything for everyone. And it involves so many more parameters than just saying what people should do. They should also think it's interesting, engaging and fun, maybe, yeah. to do it. We are all like that. I wouldn't want to do anything I didn't understand or <laughs> didn't find interesting. So, I mean, there is no difference of being a seafarer or being someone else. Absolutely not. And I think... Everybody wants to do a good job. Mm. But the trick is to give everybody the tools they need and the education they need mm. to make, to do that job properly. And if you get the culture right as well, then you won't only have given them the knowledge and the tools, but also culture where you're reinforcing that education, that knowledge, you're sharing, you're making it better all the time. Mm. It can be a very difficult thing to do. But when you get it right, you can reach amazing results. So how do you see the future for shipping in general? In general, that's a very broad question. I know. <laughs> uh, I think there are a lot of good things happening in shipping right now. From a commercial perspective, it's been a lot of very tough years since 2008, eight nine, basically. Yeah. There's been a few peaks when the market's been good, but they've been fairly short-lived. So there's been a lot of commercial pain in the shipping industry. Also, there's a lot of regulatory pain. And this is good pain. This is pain that the shipping industry need. We need clear 
simple regulation. And that's pretty tough on the emission standards and on how we run the ships. So that's a good thing. But change is always painful for any organization. And those who embrace change, they are the ones who will come out at the wi- as the winners of this. Mm-hmm. But I think the shipping industry is changing. We're seeing a lot of consolidation right now. Again, I think I mentioned it earlier, that smaller, medium-sized companies, they have some difficulties. It's difficult with regulations, requires a fairly big regulatory department to follow up all the requirements, make sure you do things right. Finance is another part where size, bigger is better, basically. And then you have the last piece, which I think shipping is starting to embrace now, which is to become more information-based, more digital is the, usually the word the used, word. <laughs> the buzzword. And I think shipping is fascinating today because it can be extremely different. A lot of shipping companies are very digital. I was on board of a ship a few weeks back where the bridge looked like a spaceship. It was a beautiful bridge, very thought out, well laid out, huge screens with everything on. You really felt like you had all the information you needed on that vessel. A couple of years back, I was on a new building in Korea where I got more or less depressed by being on the bridge. Ship looked great, but the bridge had the same layout as a ship built in 1992. Mm -hmm. It was based on the easiest way to install the smallest radar screen possible. There was no good place for the captain or the pilot or anyone on the bridge to sit down and do a good job. All the equipment was there, but you really felt that this was built by, by a person who would not be working on the vessel. So there's a huge difference between different companies on how much they embrace technology and how you can make working on board a ship better and more efficient. That being said, going digital in the shipping industry today is difficult. There are a lot of great solutions out there, but they're not connected. So size again becomes a factor. If you're a big company, you can have your own big IT department, then you can work with connecting the systems that needs to be connected. If you're a smaller company, there's no set solution. You have to start buying one software for this, one solution for that, and so on. And it gets a bit cumbersome and not very smooth. And I, what we see from Lean Marine and what I see in the industry as well is that a lot of companies are realizing this and are trying to take that position of being the platform for shipping. That's a difficult position to take because there are a lot of people vying for the position but also there's a lot of things that needs to get connected. It's not just to build a website and say, okay, let's put all the content here because the different applications work very differently, have different data and other technical issues arise very quickly. But I think we're going to see that happening in the next couple of years. And I think a lot of companies are in a good position to actually start building on their current platforms to sort of make it easier for the ship ownership manager to have one system for all the commercial part, one system for the whole technical part, and so on. Are we talking open data here? Open data for sure. Mm-hmm. It's having common uh, APIs, common ways of exchanging data. Data doesn't necessarily have to be open. The shipping industry has a tendency to be a bit secretive with everything, but that is changing as well. Looking at the world today, Keeping secrets is getting more and more difficult by the day. So I think that's going to change as well. I met someone who said that it it used to start with all these consultants um, for digitalization and and people sitting outside the ship-owning companies. And now the trend is that the ship-owning companies are employing the data brains into their companies and capturing all the data and trying to analyze and do something with it. And I mean, that is probably something that is supporting what you are saying, that that it's it's changing and it's so interesting. It really is. And it's fun to see some of the companies that I think are getting it right. It might be an expensive journey for the first movers, for sure. But still, a company like Claveness has made a big investment in becoming digital, Hmm. building a platform that works for them and others. That, I think, is definitely the right way to go. 
a lot of the other big companies are doing it as well. This might make it more difficult for smaller companies, at least in the outset. But in the long run, it might actually be that there is a standardized product, Mm -hmm. which might make it easier for a smaller company. Because they'll just buy the Microsoft suite for shipping, and then they're up and running and have everything set. Another big change that I see happening in the shipping industry when it comes to data is that the power is changing. The bigger companies, the customers, like the oil companies, they will be better at mining the data. And they will utilize having more information, knowing where all the ships are, what cargos they have, where the cargos are and where they're moving. So I think that's going to change the power structure in the industry as well and make it more industrial uh, when it comes to how the markets move than it is today. Today, it's extremely volatile and can a rumor can change the market very, very easily. Mm-hmm. So it's a change for the better. Again, I'm going back to change is always a bit painful for the people who, who use the old system. But then again, change also means there are opportunities. There are opportunities to do things better. And I definitely believe it will be a better market or a better industry because of the change. Everything that's happening means that we are improving what we're doing. We're increasing productivity. We're making the ships more efficient. It might not be that every part of the system will make money of that, but the system as a whole will be better. And it also means, I think, about doing a career in the maritime industry. We will need more people with other skills that we, than we have had before. In the very old days, everyone was recruited from a ship. And, and now we have other, other success factors, I think, for, for people who, you, who we want to recruit and, and who are coming into our industry and, and making the change with us. And as you said, you were talking about the, the bridge, what it looks like today. That might be more appealing to young people than, than the old bridge, so to say. No, absolutely. I fully agree with you. And I think work on board will change as well over time. We're going more into automation. We're going to connected ships. Just having internet on board makes a huge difference for people today. That means you can communicate with your family, you can stay in touch, you can get information on what's happening. So that alone, I think, improves life on board quite dramatically for a lot of people. Also, working in a modern environment that is more suited to your needs will make a difference. There's always going to be a need for good seamanship. But there's also going to be a need for very different skill sets. Not necessarily the ones we see today or saw 50 years ago. And I think that goes for the whole world. Jobs will change. A lot of jobs will disappear. And they will be more knowledge-based and uh, based on other skill sets. And that means we'll just have to keep up. We have to educate ourselves and the people around us. We have to make sure that the people with the best knowledge today can keep utilizing that knowledge, but in a different environment 20 years from now. Mm. It's exciting times, I think. (laughs) It definitely is exciting times. And then we haven't even started talking about what fuel the ships will run on or (laughs) all of that big question mark. No. Things will happen next year, 2020, everyone says. What do you think? I think we're going to be a bit underwhelmed. Changes in shipping have had a tendency to be hyped. Everything's going to happen. There's going to be a huge difference. The world's going to be upside down. And then when you close in, yes, things aren't amazingly smooth, but there's so much flexibility in the markets, flexibility within the companies, flexibility on how to make things work. So at the end of the day, it won't be this amazing change of everything. There will be change. It will force us to think differently, but it will be a step change, not a complete revolution. That is my view anyhow. And I think it's a good thing that's happening. Again, we need, the shipping industry needs clear rules because they actually help us improve. Mm -hmm. Regulation in the shipping industry has very often been very clumsily implemented. I think this one is might be interesting when we get there, 
but it's fairly clear what the target is, when it's coming into force, who will have to follow it. So I think from that perspective, it will push everyone in the same direction. I often talk about what happened. That I mean, we live in the middle, in the heart of the Seca area, yeah. the, the sulfur area. So we had this five years earlier. And before that was implemented here, some of the ship owners were like, ooh, that will never happen. No, we are not going that way. And after the implementation and people realized they had to live up to these new regulations, so many things have been invented, mm -hmm. so many new thoughts and so many amazing ideas. So I am expecting a little bit different things from the 2020. <laughs> I'm expecting everyone to take that thinking cap on because everyone wants to... Yeah, they want to be sustainable, but I think they also want to, to have a look at the bottom line and, and is there another way of doing this than we have done the last centuries or something like that? I don't know. No, absolutely. <laughs> Changes like this force invention, and that's the fun part. You need a bit of struggle to do things differently. And from Lean Marine's perspective, this is an amazing time because our products have always had a good return investment. But come 2020, all of a sudden that investment looks even better because the fuel is more expensive, unless you have a scrubber on board. So that is pushing a lot of people to think in new ways. And I think all that we're seeing, this slow change on how we're running, how we're looking at the environment, sustainability, running, making sure the carbon dioxide emissions are as small as possible, that's pushing us to think differently. We need to try and we need to make the small and the big changes. Whether you turn off the light when you leave the room, that's a small change. Or you put a flatner rotor on your ship, that's a big expensive change. You need to do both. You need to try it all and see where we can go to. And I think when it comes to fuels as an example, which is in my mind a huge question mark. I have no idea what future fuels will be for the shipping industry, but I know we need to try it. We need to try to figure out what works, what works where, and basically hammer it out that way. Because there's no way to know today. The data just isn't there. And when the data is there and somebody makes an investment, you can be sure that the market pricing is going to change for next year. And all of a sudden that investment goes from looking amazing to looking so-so. Mm. And I think that's one of the things being in a bit of a turning point for the industry as well. If you want to design a ship today, what do you design? Do you take the standard ship design that's been the same basically since the 70s? Or do you do all of the new exciting stuff? You want to have, a, have it methanol powered, LNG powered, with a kite in the front pushing it, pulling it, and a new hull form and all of that. That is not easy to know because doing all the interesting novel stuff is going to be very expensive for you. Getting the old ship will be a lot cheaper and you don't know how fuel prices are going to change or what your customers are going to demand. We all know that the customers will get more picky. So the old type of ship is probably not going to be good enough. But the question is how far to push it and in which direction. And I think that makes it a little bit difficult for the shipping industry today. We don't really know which way to go. And I'm really impressed by the companies who dare to try something new, that go with gas-powered ships, that try on the flatten rotors, go with methanol power and so on and so forth, because I think that's what we need to move ahead. Try it out, see if it works, and then learn from that. Do you think that there will be a disrupting company coming in here, like the Googles or the Apples, or I don't know who's... There's definitely room for it. Mm -hmm. When I started in the shipping industry, coming from much more IT-based world, my first thought was, why aren't all the cargos on a website? Put them on a website, and then you just match them with all the ships that you put on the same website, and voila, it's done. <laughs> After a couple of years in the industry, I realized, okay, that's not going to happen anytime soon. But now we're slowly, slowly seeing some movements in that direction. It's been a lot of 
attempts to get there, all reasonably unsuccessful. But I think things are starting to move. Things mo will move in that general direction. There could be an Uber of the of shipping, where all cargoes, where you basically match cargoes and ships. I don't see it happening anytime soon, but whoever reaches that position is going to disrupt the industry magnificently. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely room for disruption, but there's also, it's a difficult industry to disrupt because it is fairly slow moving and it's very global. So you can't, you might be able to disrupt on one market as a starting point, but getting the whole global shipping disrupted is going to be, uh, it's going to take time. So how do we become more visible, the maritime industry, to the general public, I mean? That is a bit of a difficult question. We, I know there's been a lot of attempts, I've been part of a few of them as well, to be more visible, talk more about shipping, make young people want to go into shipping, because that's extremely important. Even if we need different skills, we also need people who, uh, who live for shipping, who are, want to be in shipping. And I saw an extremely depressing statistics a few years at the NMIPA conference where they, in the US, had ranked different jobs on how much people wanted to work in that area. And out of 150 different jobs, being a seaman was on position 149. And starting from that position, everything we do is good. So trying to be visible, we have something in Sweden now called Sjöfors Karavanen that's traveling around, trying to talk about shipping. We have the different industry organizations trying to push shipping and why it's good. And I think more we can do there, the better. Because shipping can improve when it comes to environmental footprint. But if you compare shipping with any other type of transportation, it's extremely efficient. Largely due to the amount of cargo we move. But even so, Moving cargo from train or from, uh, from lorries to ships is always a good idea from an environmental perspective. And I think that's something we can push even further, push even harder. Yeah, for the young people, they, they are much more occupied with sustainability than we were when we were young or I was when I was young. So I think maybe that could also be appealing to people to work in an environment of sustainable people if we just uh, can get that message across yeah. to them. And that's funny. I mean, that's for me, that was one of the reasons I wanted to work with Lean Marine because I felt this is a company that fits what I want to achieve in life. But we also see now that we are recruiting people for the company that what the recruitment agency says, oh, you have a green profile. Great. That's what people are looking for. They're looking for a company that have the same values as they, they do. So I fully agree with what you're saying. Having that green profile and showing that shipping is green. Mm. Shipping has been stained by uh, oil spills and all sorts of disasters over years. But looking at it as a transport mode of transport, it's actually a very sustainable way of shipping things. And we are improving at a pretty good rate, I would say. So that is a very, makes it a fun industry to be in because we can prove a lot of improvement on how we ship things from A to B, how much fuel or carbon dioxide is produced. And I think that is, that is something we need to promote even further. Who do you think I should meet the next? Who would you be interested in listening to in the shipping podcast? I, you have already spoken to a lot of my favorites, actually. I've spoken to Lasse Kristoffersson, David Christensen, and so on. But looking at the people you haven't reached yet, there are some good people I could recommend. I know you don't have that many commercial people. Not yet. And no. in the Team Tankers company, we have Sten Eriksen and we have uh, Mikael Obling, who are both, I find, very entertaining and well-spoken people that I think would make... Uh, pretty would be very interesting to talk to. We also have a female captain, Petra Arnfors, who's also a very well-spoken woman and has been a captain for many years and can sort of give you that aspect. I know you've spoken to other female captains, but she's definitely a good example. Uh, going on 
Other Women, I think Ann-Marie Åström of Gotland could be an excellent example as well. She's also on the council in Intertanko, which I think is an interesting organization for making things happen in the tanker industry. So that's another person I would recommend. And if none of those want to talk to you, then you can always talk to my sister, Ulrika Laurin, <laughs> who are on a couple of boards of uh, tanker and dry bulk uh, companies. I will persuade them all to speak to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't really think about that, that people doesn't want to speak to me. Yeah, that yeah, might be I'm something. I'm sure they all want to speak to you. <laughs> I'm just pulling your leg. Thank you, Mikael. Thank you for taking the time to speak to me. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Mikael. I wish you all the best with your relatively new position while I try to find more people who wants to speak to me. You got a point there, probably. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you, the listener, for this year which has comprised of so many things for me and for the podcast. I have learned so many new things. I met so many fantastic people, some of them willing to sit down in front of the microphone with me, and even more people who just helped me open doors, come with advice, help me produce, and to coach me. I have grown this year. And I hope that you can hear that when you listen to the podcast. Now it's time for a new decade. And I hope you look forward to 2020 as much as I do. You can help me by talking about the shipping podcast and spreading the word. The more people that downloads the podcast, the better the chance that we can have an impact on that algorithm that controls how far this podcast will spread. My aim is, of course, that more people would get to know what happens in our fascinating industry. So while you do that, I will take some time to figure out what I would like you to hear during the next year. So until the next time, from me to you, over and out. Thank you for listening to The Shipping Podcast. Don't forget to tell everyone that you meet that there is a shipping podcast available and that they should download it and listen to the maritime professionals who are sharing their passion for the shipping industry. 